Thank you so much for inviting me and allowing me to distract you a little bit after a stressful week. Um, so we're going to start at the beginning. We're going to start with what is infrared light. We'll talk a little bit about Spitzer, the logistics of the spacecraft and the engineering that goes into it. Um, and then uh, I'll have some highlights of some of Spitzer science results. And I'll state straight up that it's a highly biased and incomplete list, but I only have just so much time. Um, and then the last little bit that I have talks about how you too can get access to some of the Spitzer data. So NASA has a lot of space-based uh, telescopes, but only four have been special enough to be given the name NASA's Great Observatories. And they were specifically selected to span a wide range of wavelengths. So on the left here, there's the Compton Gamma Ray Observatory. That satellite is no longer with us. It's re-entered the atmosphere. There's the Chandra X-ray Observatory. We'll talk more about that in a little bit, but that's definitely still working. There's Hubble, which is still working in the visible. And then there's Spitzer in the infrared, which is as of January 2020, unfortunately not working. Um, so the reason why astronomers, I mean, we're studying things we can never ever go visit. And in many cases, we can't even see from another angle. So um, we, it, we have to take advantage of all of the information that we get from these, uh, from these celestial sources and with all the different kinds of light that there are. So right here, I've got the same little galaxy in several different wavelengths. So on the left, I've got uh, an X-ray image that was taken with the Chandra X-ray Observatory. Here is an ultraviolet image taken with Galax. Um, in the visible light, there's the HST image of this galaxy. In the near infrared, you could use a ground-based survey called TUMAS, or you could use Spitzer data. And in the far infrared, you could use Spitzer or another spacecraft called Herschel. And you can see they're all, they're all lined up. It's all the same orientation, all the same alignment. But you can see there are different things that are bright and faint in these various wavelengths. There are things that are dark in some wavelengths that are bright in others. And that's where the astrophysics is. The kinds of light that we're looking at. So for X-ray light, the wavelength of the light is two nanometers. A nanometer is a billionth of a meter. So little tiny photons. But in terms of things that are emitting thermally, in order to emit X-rays, you've got to be like a million Kelvin. And we do have such things. They're found among other places in black hole accretion disks. In the ultraviolet, the wavelengths of light are like 200 nanometers. And you're looking at things that are maybe 15,000 Kelvin. These are the hot stars, which are also young stars. In the visible, you're looking at things at wavelengths of light that are like 500 nanometers or half a micron. A micron is a, a millionth of a meter. And you're looking at things that are maybe 6,000 Kelvin. So these tend to be the run of the mill stars like our sun. Um, and then in the near infrared, the kinds of wavelengths are like 1,600 nanometers or 1 1.6 microns. Things are about 2,000 Kelvin. And these are usually the very cool stars, which are usually the old stars. In the far infrared, uh, you're looking at wavelengths that are like 100,000 nanometers or 100 microns. Temperatures are like 30 Kelvin. And this tends to be the dust that's heated by the hot stars. So very different physics that we're looking at, very different um, features of the, of the target that we're looking at in all these different wavelengths. So I work at IPAC at Caltech, and we focus on the infrared. We have a very biased view of the electromagnetic spectrum. So most of the rest of, well, all of the rest of the stuff that I'm going to tell you about has to do with infrared. My cat is trying to contribute. Hang on one second. Come on. Come on. There we go. Okay, so here I have a picture of a little dog on the left in visible light and on the right in infrared light. And there's two really, really important things here. One is that I had to translate the wavelengths of infrared light into visible light so that we can see it. And you will sometimes find that, kind, that process called false color images. But let's be honest, especially in the last couple of years, words matter, word choice matters. And false color makes it sound like I'm hiding something. It's not really false color, it's remapped color because I'm taking the, the light in the infrared and translating it into light that I can see. Because remember that a true color infrared image is really boring because you can't see infrared light. So if you wanna see anything, I have to translate those infrared photons into light that you can see. And the way that I'm translating that it corresponds to temperature scale. So you can see that he's got a water dish that is cool because the cool colors are like black and purple and his water dish is cool. But when you go to the warmer colors, you're getting or the warmer temperatures, you're getting into you know the yellows and the whites. 
So you can see the fluff of fur around his head is, is cool. His ears are warm. His face is warm, but because he's a healthy little dog, nose is cool. Is someone trying to ask a question? Or we, do we just have audio leakage? I don't know if it's making it difficult, making it difficult for other people to hear. Can you, whoever is, let's see. Oh, yeah, yeah. I don't Okay, well, I'm just going to continue. Um, if one of the people that have that'd be appreciated. Okay, so yeah, so now I here's the point that I've remapped the I've changed the colors of the shirt. Okay, so let's keep going. Okay, so now you know that hot things glow in the infrared. So think about what that's going to look like. Which one of these is the hot water? It's the one on the bottom. You can see the base of the faucet heating up. You can see the, the basin itself heating up. And even the hot water is on, the base of the faucet here is still cool because it's the cold water. So now, what do you think that's gonna look like in infrared light? I can tell you the hair dryer is on. There you can see the heating elements of the, of the hair dryer and even turbulence in the hot air that it's blowing. So now you know that infrared can reveal things that are totally hidden in visible light. But infrared can also see through some things that are totally opaque in visible light. This is just a regular green you know, garbage bag that you might use for yard waste. And you can see straight through it in the infrared. It turns out that you personally are really grateful for this particular feature of infrared light, because if you were unconscious in a burning building, this is how the firemen will find you. The firefighters often have, even in small cities, they often have infrared cameras because it does allow you to see through the smoke. And so you can see the firefighter here, parts of him are very warm and he's got something that's helping to keep him cool in the back there. Um, you uh, probably know because you guys live in hill country that forest fires are a big concern. And so almost all the Foothill community fire departments have infrared cameras on helicopters so that they can actually look for hot spots in the hills. Some police departments do too. A couple of years ago when it was like 120 here in LA, they were chasing a fugitive up into the Hollywood Hills. And normally when you're, when you're watching a warm human run through the mountains, the human is warm compared to the background. But when the human is running through rocks that have been baking at 120 degrees all day, he's actually cool compared to the rocks, but the infrared can still find him. So some things that are transparent and visible light are totally opaque in the infrared. Here I've got a set of French doors in my living room. This door is closed, this door is open, and you can see me, but not through the glass. So, um, this incidentally is why when you park your car in the sun in the summer, you can't touch the steering wheel when you get in the car because all of the sunlight, the optical sunlight comes through the windows of your car, heats up the inside of your car, which then radiates in the infrared, but the infrared can't get out through the glass. So that's why it's so hot inside your car. So think of all the infrared that's trapped in the car the next time you have to drive with just two fingers. So we've been looking at sort of everyday things in the infrared. Now I'm going to depart every day. Here I've got something that um, astronomers call a doer. It's really just a fancy word for thermos bottle. And I've got liquid nitrogen in it. So the liquid nitrogen that's in it up here um, has, is 77 Kelvin. So the camera can't actually see things that are that cold. So it just gives up and cover, colors the whole thing black. But now on the bottom, I'm going to put frozen peas inside the, the nitrogen. Now the frozen peas are cold, but not as cold as the nitrogen. So the infrared camera can see them glowing against the background. And so that's what's exactly what's going on when we observe in the infrared in space. Some of the things we're looking at are very cool, but they're still warm compared to the background. So we can find them in the infrared. Here is the everyday uh, Orion constellation. And then here is the same field of view in the infrared, how much you miss if you limit yourself to just the optical. You probably knew that the Sword of Orion was a giant star forming cauldron, 
but I bet you didn't know that the belt is also forming stars. And here you can see a big circle. When you find circles in this interstellar medium, the fluff, the, the nebulosity, it almost certainly means that something exploded. So almost certainly this is the remnants of a stellar explosion some time ago where the, the shock front is sweeping up the matter into a sphere. So why do we need to go to space to do infrared astronomy? Well, the number one reason is that space is cold. If you're trying to observe tiny little bits of heat, your telescope better be cold. I mean, when you are able to observe um, from the ground in the infrared, you have to pick a very high, very dry site like Palomar, but the, te the telescope is still the same temperature as the air around it. And so the telescope itself is glowing in the infrared. So the best analogy I can think of is if is observing in the infrared from the ground is like observing in the optical from a telescope made out of those long cylindrical fluorescent light tubes because the telescope itself is glowing. And so you have to do, you have to take special care to get rid of the background radiation in the infrared. The other big reason is that the atmosphere absorbs infrared light. So here I have a cartoon that's transmission as roughly as a function of wavelength here. And if you're a gamma ray astronomer or an X-ray astronomer or an ultraviolet astronomer, you have no choice. You have to go to space because those that light doesn't make it down to the ground. Visible light, of course, makes it down to the ground. Um, and there are, so if you pick your site really well and you pick your wavelength really well, you can observe in some near infrared bands from the ground. All of these absorption features are from things that we really like having in the atmosphere, like water and oxygen, um, but they make it really hard to observe in the infrared. And the longer infrared wavelengths, you have no choice. You have to go to space in order to observe. And the radio, a lot of the radio makes it down to the ground as well. So this Spitzer was launched in August, 2003. Um, and this is really what it looked like. If you've never had an opportunity to watch a launch in Florida, most of the pictures that you see that have like stands of people watching launches, those are designed for the manned missions because those are the ones that they have the most um, public enthusiasm over. And those launch pads are not the same launch pads that they use necessarily for the unmanned launches like from Spitzer. So it turns out that from the launch pad that Spitzer launched from, the best place to view it was actually not on NASA property, but on a fishing pier that just south of the Cape. And so this is really what it looked like. This was the middle of the night and there was a long fishing pier full of maybe half a dozen annoyed fishermen and like 150 screaming astronomers watching Spitzer launch. So this is really what it looked like, fishing poles and all. Um, so Spitzer, the person, the NASA has taken to um, choosing a name uh, from a uh, competition, right? You kids can't from all over the world can submit suggestions. And so Spitzer was chosen from those entries. Um, the Spitzer, the person, he was, his name was Lyman Spitzer. He worked at Princeton and he did a lot of really amazing things. But one of the things that really sticks in my mind is that in 1946, he proposed putting a telescope in space. Think about that. In 1946, the only rockets that we really had that could really be called rockets were German V2s. And he had the vision to say, okay, let's take the warhead off of there and let's put a telescope on the top of that rocket and see what we can see if we get up above the atmosphere. He was also a primary driving force between get, you know, behind getting Hubble launched. It also turns out that he studied the interstellar medium, the stuff between the stars, something that Spitzer sees a lot of. So Spitzer the spacecraft, on the left was the original design for Spitzer the spacecraft. You can see it was pretty big and it had a big, basically thermos bottle inside of which was the cryogen to help keep the telescope uh, cold. And the entire telescope was inside that cryogen bath. Well, there was a lot of uh, budget crises between 1990 and the early 2000s. And a lot of really clever engineers figured out a way to make the spacecraft much lighter and therefore much cheaper to build, test, and launch, but still have the same size telescope. So you have the same size telescope, but now the cryogen is kept separate from the telescope and the cryogen exhausts past the telescope to help keep it cool. But you can see the spacecraft is much smaller. So lots of really great engineering uh, basically saved Spitzer from being canceled due to the budget. Here's the spacecraft itself. You can see it's not very big. Um, here are the solar panels on the spacecraft and then the telescope itself is here. The light comes in from the top and here's where the mirror sits down here. The instruments sit there and the cryogen 
is down here. So this side of the telescope is painted silver so that any little bits of heat that get past the solar cells um, gets re uh, reflected back. And then the, the far side of Spitzer is painted black so that it can passively cool, passively radiate away into space. And it works really well. It's able to cool off very efficiently with this design. So now I have a whole series of slides um, that are talking about the different kinds of orbits that these various space telescopes have. And if you have not yet discovered the website Eyes on the Solar System from JPL, you should definitely Google that and check it out. It is really fun. You can uh, see all of the things in our solar system, the, the, main, the, the artificial satellites, the real satellites, you can run time forward and backward. It's, it's really cool. So if you haven't played with that yet, you should. Okay. So this is, was, it, was there a question? No. Okay. So this is Hubble. It is in low Earth orbit, which means that it's relatively close to Earth. And you can see from Hubble's perspective how large the Earth is looming. It turns out that Hubble spends a significant time of each orbit simply trying not to look at the Earth because the Earth is so big and so close. There are a lot of satellites in low Earth orbit, and you can see the satellite, whoop, come back here, well, all of the satellite trails there from the Eyes on the Solar System simulation. So you can see there's lots of things that are up there. Um, we're going to zoom out a little bit. So this is HST's orbit here, and you can see there's more spacecraft. But where are the other telescopes? This is the Chandra X-ray Observatory, and it actually orbits in a long elliptical orbit. It goes about a third of the way to the moon on every orbit. So you can see that it's got a much different orbit than Hubble, but it's still orbiting the Earth. We're going to zoom out even further. I don't know if you can see them on your screen, but there are two satellites called Van Allen Probe A and B. Those are designed to study something called the Van Allen belts, which are basically sort of bubbles of charged particles caught in our magnetic field. And they are extremely difficult on spacecraft. They're extremely hard on spacecraft. So the spacecraft takes quite a bit of punishment when it goes through those Van Allen belts. Um, we're gonna zoom out even further. We still haven't found um, Spitzer. So this is very roughly now. There's the sun and the earth. There's Kepler. And there's Spitzer all the way further away. So Spitzer is orbiting the sun just like Earth does. There's Mercury, there's Venus, and Spitzer is trailing behind in Earth's orbit. This is right after launch in 2005 when Spitzer was right close to Earth. And this is a five years after launch. So that was the end of the nominal mission and about when we ran out of cryogen. But because the passive cooling works so well, we could keep operating. And now it's quite a bit further away than it was before. So of all of these orbit slides, here are the main takeaway points. Hubble orbits Earth very close to Earth. Chandra orbits Earth, but in a long elliptical orbit. Spitzer, in contrast, orbits the sun, not the Earth. And moreover, Spitzer is trailing slowly away from us. So this orbit that Spitzer has is really good because we don't have to spend a lot of time simply trying not to look at the earth or the moon, we can spend the overwhelming majority of time doing science. Also by getting away from the earth, we don't have to deal with the Van Allen belts. We don't have to deal with those radiation belts that are caught that cause damage to spacecraft. So especially a spacecraft like Chandra, which is designed to focus X-rays, which act like high energy particles. When Chandra goes through the Van Allen belts, um, it's not good because it's focusing all of those high energy particles on the detectors, just like it focuses the photons on the detectors. So Chandra takes damage and every time it goes through something called the South Atlantic anomaly, which is part of the, the magnetic structure. So um, we don't have to worry about that. And by getting away from the earth moon system, it's much cooler. It's a better thermal environment. And so we can passively cool very efficiently. And cool is absolutely critical to, for Spitzer to do what it does. So in between launch in August, 2003 and May, 2009, it was operating at below 12 Kelvin because it had cryogen on board that was used very sparingly to, to cool off the telescope when we need it, needed it to be cooled off. 
we had, because we could passively cool very efficiently when we ran out of cryogen in July, 2009, we could start observing with the telescope at 28 Kelvin. Now it's true that of the three instruments that we had on Spitzer, we lost two instruments entirely when the telescope warmed up and then two of the four channels on the last instrument. So we only had two channels left, but they worked just as well as they had when we had cryogen. And so we were able to do fabulous amounts of science and we turned off just earlier this year. So there's 16 years of phenomenal Spitzer data to mine. So connecting all the dots here, Spitzer's Earth trailing orbit um, is good and it needs to be cool in order to observe in the infrared. And I didn't mention this very much, but it doesn't have any moving parts. But that means that it has to turn the whole telescope to talk to Earth when it needs to talk to Earth and send the data back. And remember that Spitzer is now a whole lot further away than it was before. So the antenna that it has was designed for communicating with Earth when it was not, when it was very relatively close to us, less than an astronomical unit, which is the distance between the Earth and the Sun. So that, all of those things combined means that there really is a natural end of the mission. So in this graph, the Earth and the Sun are inertial, they're in the same place. And so Spitzer at launch is relatively close to Earth, but then continues to, to drift away. And so the cryogen ran, ran out when it was about, you know, about half an AU, three quarters of an AU away. But it's going to continue to drift away and drift away and drift away. And you can see here, the satellite dish is there. Here, it's easy to talk to Earth and keep the solar panels facing the sun. But by here, in order to talk to Earth, it has to turn its solar panels away from the sun. So much like you, if you're using your cell phone to navigate yourself somewhere and you're running out of battery and you're, you're just hoping that the, the phone has enough juice left that will give you the directions you need to get where you're going, that's the same sort of thing that Spitzer was experiencing when it was talking to Earth near the end of its mission. Because in order to, to, to turn to talk to Earth by turning its satellite, its solar panels away, it's no longer charging the battery. So it had to run its batteries down in order to communicate with Earth. And so that as act was actually the limiting factor in how long it could talk to Earth. It stayed talking to Earth as long as it could and then turned back to put the solar panels facing the sun so it could cool off and recharge and then it could resume doing science. So this is an animation that shows this process. So here's the sun on the left and the Earth on the right. There's the spacecraft turning to talk to Earth. So this, the communications dish is facing Earth. That was right after launch. But as it's drifting further and further away from Earth in its orbit, near the end of the mission, it was having to turn like this in order to talk to Earth. And boy, that is hard on the spacecraft. It's it was really tough. So come on, next slide. So what do we study with Spitzer? Well, the somewhat snarky version is the old, the cold, and the dirty, because we're studying very old things, distant universe things that were um, formed not long after the universe formed that you can see very clearly in the infrared. You can study very cold things um, because you're looking in the infrared, you can see tiny bits of heat compared to the background. And you also see a lot of dusty things, a lot of, of dust like you see here on the left-hand side, there's a lot of dark parts there and all of the, the stuff that's glowing is also dust and gas. So some interesting discoveries from Spitzer in the solar system. I'm sure you knew that Saturn has rings, but I bet you didn't know that it has this giant, fluffy, tenuous outer ring around Saturn. This is to scale. So this tiny little pixel there is all of Spitzer and or all of Saturn and its famous rings, but it has this giant ring around it that is at an angle to it. And this, this, this ring is so fluffy, so diaphanous, that if you were standing in it, you probably wouldn't know it was there. But we could see, we can see it with Spitzer in the infrared. And it's about two full moons across. This is an artist's conception. This is not an actual Spitzer image. But this ring is tilted about 30 degrees from the rest of the rings. And it was guessed that it might, it must be there because for two big reasons. One is that Phoebe, which is one of Saturn's moons, orbits pretty much within this dust ring and probably is the source of the dust for the ring. 
And then there's another moon called Iapetus. And much like when you go on a road trip and you end up with a whole bunch of bugs on your windshield, but not on your rear window, Iapetus is going face first through this ring. And so Iapetus is dark on one side as it's going through the dust. And so it was um, hypothesized that there must be a ring, but we didn't know that it was there until Spitzer found it. So there's another graphic, an artist's conception showing you, okay, there's Saturn down in the middle. Iapetus is relatively close to Saturn, but it is dark on one side. And then Phoebe is probably seeding that ring with dust. So other things in our galaxy. So galactic, we, we learned from Spitzer a whole lot more about our galaxy. And it is really hard to study our own galaxy. For years, I have been getting questions when I give public talks about, well, how do you study the galaxy when you're in it? And I struggled for a long time to come up with a good analogy. But um, my son, he's now 12. When he was about two or three, he was so into planes. I thought for sure he was going to end up being a pilot because he was so into planes. Because our families live on the East Coast, even when he was very little, he had you know, a frequent flyer number because we would go back to visit family. And I'm not talking, we're not, you know, we're in the cheap seats with the cattle, don't get me wrong. But he was still so excited. And so he was sitting next to the window while we were getting ready to push back from the gate. And he's sitting with his face mushed up against the window. And I'm like, what are you doing? He's like, I'm trying to see our pilot. That's the analogy I was looking for, for studying our galaxy. So if you imagine that you're in a plane and you don't know what the outside of our, your plane looks like, you can look out the windows and see other planes. And you can guess, well, we must have a tail because every other plane that we see has a tail. So we must have a tail, even though you can't see the tail from inside the plane, we must have one because every other plane does. And then you can look out the window at other, other planes and see, okay, well, some of them have those little like, um, not flaps, but like the ends of their wings kick up and some don't. And so it might be a puzzle. Well, do we have those or do we not? I don't know. Then you could look out a slightly different window and oh yeah, you can see our wings and we do have those little things. Okay, good. All right, well, I'd like to, you know, I can see out the window at other planes. I can see almost all of them have pilots, but I can't see our pilot. How are we gonna figure this out? Infrared is the key because infrared in the analogy allows you to see through the curtains, through the, the, the cockpit door, into our pilots. So that's the analogy. We're inside the galaxy and we're trying to make good guesses about what our own galaxy looks like in part from studying other galaxies. But infrared is the key that allows you to see through the gas and dust in our galaxy and get a better sense of what our galaxy is. So we knew our galaxy was a spiral. It turns out it's a barred spiral. It's got this bar in the middle and it's got these long, these spiral arms that come off. Um, because we're human, we like to make coordinate systems centered on us. So the center of this coordinate system is the sun that's here. Um, but you can see that we're in an arm called the Orion Spur, but there's other arms that curl around, arms that go around on the far side of the galaxy. And this is part in part due to Spitzer's better understanding of the structure of the galaxy. So this is the data that was used for that. In this movie, you see here a little graphic of the, so of the galaxy and you can see this cone that's sweeping through the galaxy. What you're seeing through that cone is what's scrolling by here. So as the cone moves to encompass the center of the galaxy, there's the center of the galaxy as it scrolls past. Now we're gonna go through there to the other side of the center of the galaxy. This is the program that did this is called Glimpse. And so it has this, you know, they've mapped basically the entire 360 view of the galaxy. And um, here's another view of that data, not in movie form. There's the center of the galaxy and it sort of runs off the edge here, but then picks up over here. And you're running along through the galaxy and it runs off the edge and picks up there, right? So this is an enormous image. If you were to print this out, this image out in full resolution, it would circle the Rose Bowl, okay? This is an enormous uh, image. So another big discovery from Spitzer has to do with how stars form and how planets form. But in order to explain this, I have to have uh, have to give you a little bit of a story first. So in my experience, um, it, well, I guess in the in the public conception, like if you see in the movies, scientific discovery is often portrayed as Eureka, you know, jumping out of the bathtub and going running down the street. In my experience, that is not how science works. Science works. Science sounds more like, huh, that's weird. 
So the very first satellite that surveyed the sky was IRAS in the 1980s. It was the first infrared um, sky survey mission, and it did a lot of wonderful things. But whenever you have a new telescope or a new instrument, the very first thing that you do is look at some standard stars, some stars that help you understand how we you know how the brightness is being measured by your new new new, uh, new telescope or new detector. Um, and one of the basis, one of the the anchors of this of this system is Vega. It just it's a star called Vega, and it's just it's integral to the calibration of all sorts of astronomical measurements. And so, even though IRAS was doing an all sky survey, one of the first things that the scientists looked at were the pictures that it took of Vega. And it was bright, really bright. Huh, that's weird. Well, they said, okay, let's, I don't understand why <clears throat> Vega is coming through so bright. Let's skip that for now. Let's go on to some of these other stars that we know to be good calibrators. And in the end, they found about a dozen stars that were just too bright. And that just didn't make any sense and they couldn't figure out what was wrong. So they calibrated the data with the rest of the stars. And then they circled back to try to figure out what had gone so wrong with Vega and these other stars that are so bright. And they spent a long time trying to figure out what they'd done wrong. And then they decided that maybe they hadn't done anything wrong and what they were measuring was actually real. So what I'm gonna show you here is an artist's conception. It's not an image, but this is probably really what Vega looks like if you were able to get it close. Vega is a blue star, so there's a blue star in the middle, and Vega, it turns out, the reason it's bright in the infrared is because it has a dust ring around it. The disk doesn't go all the way into the star, it is definitely a ring, and it almost certainly has big rocks in it, and little rocks, and lots of dust, and that's why Vega is so bright in the infrared. So with Spitzer, we were able to go and study more of these in more detail and have a much better understanding of how stars form and how uh, planets form around them. This is a cartoon version of star formation. So I'm gonna start with a big dark cloud. We're gonna zoom in on one of these dense cores and just because it's gonna collapse under its own gravity. And just because of the way the physics works, it doesn't go straight in It falls onto a disc first. And then from there spirals into the central object. And for reasons nobody understands very well, but almost certainly involves magnetic fields, a certain amount of matter gets ejected above and below, you know, following the magnetic poles. Eventually that cocoon either falls onto the disc or gets blown away by the jets and you end up with something like this, then eventually the accretion rate through the disk, the rate at which that disk is pouring matter out of the star slows and the jets turn off. Then you end up with a star, well, a pre-main sequence star that has a, a protoplanetary disk around it. So a disk in which um, planets are being formed. Then eventually that disk thins out and forms planets. And by this point, you have a genuine bona fide hydrogen burning mortgage paying adult star with planets going around it all in the same direction. So these are the these are the adults, these are the teenagers, and these are the real babies, right? So now let's look at some Spitzer data demonstrating some of these phases. So this here on the left is a visible image of something that had been called a starless core. This is what Spitzer sees. So sure enough, it is definitely not starless. It's got a baby star inside. It turns out to be a baby brown dwarf, so not a very massive star, but still, uh, uh, still, it's not starless. There's something in there. This again has visible on the left and on the right is infrared. We're gonna zoom in on this chunk here. It looks pretty boring in the optical. It looks like just a dark cloud, but in the infrared, you can see there's a baby star in the middle and it's got these huge jets coming off that you can't even see in the optical. So here is one of my favorite star forming regions. It's called NGC 1333. Everything green here is a jet. So there's tons of stars with jets here. And it turns out that this, because this cluster is just at the right age to have a lot of stars with jets. But remember that in a cluster like this, the stars are moving in space as well. So it's really hard to say, okay, well, this clump, if I trace it back, came from somewhere here. Well, it might have originally, but now the star is moved. So there are people who've spent a healthy chunk of their careers trying to figure out which glob goes with which star. So this is a Hubble image. It's from M16, the Eagle Nebula. It's the talons in the Eagle. And um, this is the most popular image downloaded from the Hubble website. It's called the Pillars of Creation. Physically what's going on is that there's a bright O and B star ab above it in this view, pushing around the gas and dust and possibly prompting star formation in these talons. That's what people have been trying to study. So with Spitzer, 
it has a much bigger field of view. Here's that same image with that funny footprint from Hubble. It's down here. But the larger image here is now from Spitzer. And so the, the wavelengths of light that go into this one are between four and a half and 70 microns. So the red is 70 microns. And it turns out that that is almost certainly the remnant of a supernova. So it's not just that there's O and B stars pushing around the gas and dust, but an actual supernova that's pushing around the gas and dust and probably will end up crumpling those towers if we wait long enough. So this is, again, some of my favorite data because it's mine. Here we have on the left a visible light, and it's is called the North American Nebula because you can kind of see the East Coast and Florida, Gulf of Mexico, Mexican Riviera down here. You can kind of see it in North America. There's also the pelican, which is sometimes harder to see. There's its beak. And there's its belly. That's kind of the back of the pelican's neck. This is data in the infrared, and I swear to you it's lined up. It just looks totally different in the infrared. The back of the pelican's neck here is that. The Mexican Riviera here is that. And the Gulf of Mexico here is that. It turns out to be a massive stellar nursery with hundreds of baby stars forming in them. Zooming in on that Gulf of Mexico cluster, it's just beautiful. You can see there's so many baby stars nestled in there forming. So I haven't shown you any spectroscopy. Spitzer does have, um, or did have, a, uh, was taking spectroscopic data. So spectroscopic data just works like a prism, right? It breaks up the light like into a rainbow. So I've got a graph here that's brightness on the y-axis and wavelength is on the x-axis. So the spectrum on the bottom is from comet Hale-Bopp, which you might remember. It was a big comet that visited our inner solar system from our outer solar system several years ago. And you can see it's got lots of bumps and wiggles in it. This is a spectrum of a, of a star with the relatively boring name HD 69830, but all of those bumps and wiggles look just like Hale-Bopp's spectrum. And that tells us that the same stuff that makes up common Hale-Bopp is the stuff that's making up this disk around this star. Turns out a lot of those features come from olivine. Olivine is like green sand beaches in Hawaii. It's that kind of, of, of stuff, right? So very, very cool that we can draw the, you know, we can draw a line between stuff that is in our solar system and stuff that's in other solar systems. So Spitzer has increased the number of young stars that we know by several factors of 10. So we have a much better understanding now of the interaction between the clouds and the stars, how stars cluster, how stars form on what time scale and what time scale all of those stages in the cartoon I showed you earlier last. And it turns out that planet forming disks are everywhere. And it is absolutely no surprise that so many stars have planets. Spitzer also does contribute quite a bit to exoplanets, but let me, um, in the few minutes I have left, clarify some of the, the stuff that um, Spitzer does with exoplanets. Spitzer generally didn't discover planets, but helped us characterize the planets or find more planets. So there's really four ways to, to study exoplanets. You might have heard of the radial velocity method. So when the star, uh, when the planet when the planet orbits the star, it can tug a little bit on the star. So if you were observing the our solar system from some distance away, every time Jupiter would go around, it tugs on the sun just a little bit. And that tug is enough to, you can measure that tug. And so you can study the planets, you can identify planets around the stars by looking for those tiny little changes in velocity. You can also study um, planets using transit photometry. So here I've got brightness as a function of time. And in this cartoon, as the planet moves in front of the star, it blocks some of the light from the star. So you get a tiny little dip. You can also look for planets using something called microlensing, which is where you observe from Earth against a dense star field, and then a planet, a star planet system that's moving between you and the background stars changes the brightness of that background star just a little bit enough that you can figure out that there's a star and planet system in there. And then the last major way is direct imaging, which Palomar does a lot of, um, but Spitzer doesn't. Spitzer really focuses on transit photometry, but also microlensing. So this movie shows how the transit photometry works. So in the infrared, um, it's not just that you're watching, it's not that you're watching the planet go in front of the star, but you're actually watching the planet go behind the star in the infrared because this planet is bright in the infrared. So you see that tiny little dip 
as a function of time when the, pla the planet is moving behind the star. And so that's really cool. That means that some of the infrared photons that we're measuring is coming from the planet itself, which is pretty awesome. Um, so these, this is the actual, some of the first measurements that Spitzer took of these transits. So you can see this is brightness as a function of time. And these are tiny, tiny, tiny little dips, but they're real. And Spitzer was able to measure it, even though this was not something that Spitzer was designed to do. It turned out Spitzer was really, really good at it. One of our most famous targets is TRAPPIST-1. Here we've got an artist's conception of a red dwarf here, and it's got a whole bunch of planets. You've got steam here, liquid water, and ice. That's a little bit of foreshadowing. So TRAPPIST-1 is a small dwarf star. So it's an M8, which means it's a tiny fraction of the mass and the size of our sun. It's actually kind of closer to Jupiter in a lot of ways, but it's only 40 light years away. So it's pretty close. The reason astronomers are not great at naming things. Um, TRAPPIST is a name, whoops, TRAPPIST is the name of a network of uh, well, a couple of telescopes that um, these people started using to look for planets. And the reason the planet is called TRAPPIST or the system is called TRAPPIST-1 is because this is the first system they found planets in. So in 2016, they reported finding three planets, but they came to Spitzer and asked for and got six hours to observe using Spitzer because the star is so faint and red, it's so much easier to observe this particular star in the infrared rather than in the optical in order to learn more about the planets. So this was what their initial findings were. You've got the small red dwarf in the middle, you've got two planets that are relatively close in and their optical data suggested that there might be a third planet on the outside. So they went and got all this Spitzer data and the transits were weird. Huh, that's strange. What did we do wrong? How, did, how does this not work? How did we screw this up? And I go back and reproduce the data and no, we didn't screw it up. The transits really are strangely shaped. And at first they made no sense, but it turns out that there's a lot of planets in this system. And so they came back to Spitzer and said, please, can we have 20 days to do this? Because Spitzer is so good at, at doing these kinds of measurements. We really need to be able to stare for 20 days. And so we worked really hard with the scientists to try to take as much data as we could, essentially continuously, as continuously as we could over 20 days. And they had also organized lots of other observatories to stare at the same, uh, at the same time. So in 2017, they were able to say, hello, this guy has a ton of planets. The, traditionally, the star itself is A, so the first planet is B, and then C, D, E, F, G, and H. So a huge number of planets in this system. It turns out, though, that it's very different than our solar system. Down here, we have a schematic of our solar system, but our sun is very different. And the TRAPPIST planets are very close into their star, much closer than our orbit of Mercury. Turns out it's more like Jupiter's Jovian moon system than it is our solar system. So of course the science just keeps going. They came back to Spitzer and got a thousand hours of essentially continuous Spitzer time. And so they were trying to figure out as much as they could about these planets. And so now we know more about TRAPPIST-1 than any other solar system except for ours. So this is what the data actually look like. All of those white points are measurements of brightness of the star and all of these little dips are the individual planets. And because they're so close to each other, they tug on each other. So they're all in resonance, right? So the reason the transits were hard to explain is that there were sometimes two objects transiting at the same time, sometimes two right close to each other. So this is, if you were able to stand on one of the planets around TRAPPIST, this is likely what you would see because those planets are really, really close together. This is just one of a whole series of these exoplanet travel bureau posters. If you haven't found them yet, you should. You should Google that because they're really cool. And then the uh, last- Dr. Rebo, could, yeah? I have a question. Could I, could I sure. interrupt with a question? Sure. Um, question is, what spectral bands did Spitzer have originally and what bands were working after the cryogen ran out? So there were three instruments um, and it observed between three and a half and 160 microns. So MIPS was a long wavelength imager. It did 2470 and 160 microns and some spectroscopy. And that one was lost because the spacecraft has to be cooler in order to observe in those long wavelengths. Then the infrared, uh, the IRS infrared um, sectograph, 
that took spectra and a few images between about five and about 20 microns. And then IRAC is the short wavelength uh, camera and it has four bands. It has three and a half, four and a half, 5.8 and eight microns. We lost the 5.8 and eight microns when this telescope warmed up. So we we're left with three and a half and four and a half microns, which is why in some of these, I guess it doesn't have the, the wavelength on it, but these are all three and a half and four and a half micron. I think it's actually three and a half micron um, monitoring. So in the few minutes I have left, the gravitational micro lensing looks like this. You've got a background star, you've got a star and planet that's gonna move in front of that background star and it's gonna bend the light. So it's gonna change the brightness that we see. So that tiny little blip, that shoulder is what tells you there's a planet there. So the difficulty with microlensing, it's really hard and the math is pretty hairy. So if all you have is observations from earth, you have two different solutions that can match the data that you have. And it's difficult to tell the difference because both of them um, work just as well with the observations. But since Spitzer was so far away, it was able to take simultaneous data and then that breaks that degeneracy. It allows us to tell what the mass and distance is of that planet. So this is the actual data. This is the first microlensing planet. So there's brightness as a function of time. And the white points here are the ground-based optical data and the red parts are the Spitzer data. So that shoulder there is what tells you that there's a planet there. So in the last couple of slides I have, last couple of minutes, um, we're gonna go down a little bit down the digital rabbit hole. All of these data are yours too. So if you go to the Cool Cosmos website, you can find lots of information about how infrared is used in everyday life, but also images of infrared celestial objects and a timeline of infrared missions. Infrared gets used in a lot of different ways. I mentioned the firefighting, but it's also used for um, art restoration and archeology span and environmental monitoring, lots of stuff. Um, so this is my last slide. I'm going to leave it up um, for a little while. Uh, it's got all of the URLs that I've been mentioning. So the very first one that's listed there is the main Spitzer website. And it, um, if you haven't checked them out yet, there's a bunch of videos, including some IR relevant astronomy, like irrelevant astronomy videos that are very funny. Some of them are have won awards. The Universe Unplugged website has uh, more recent videos, but also involving stars from Hollywood. There, the third website there is the one that's specifically designed for the end of the Spitzer mission. I mentioned the Cool Cosmos website. Um, I The TRAPPIST-1 system, we've got a really cool virtual reality movie that allows you to fly around the TRAPPIST-1 system. So if you go to the Oculus store or even just YouTube, if you don't have one of those fancy headsets, it's still, if you search on exoplanet excursions, you can find this VR movie. Um, there's the Exoplanet Travel Bureau I mentioned. It's got not only the posters, but also some interactive website things. I mentioned the eyes on the solar system that's there. There's an app called NASA Selfies so that you can take a picture of you, a selfie of yourself and it'll put you inside an astronaut helmet and put you um, in the foreground of some of these uh, really cool Spitzer images. If you want something more tangible, there's a book called More Things in the Heavens that was published in 2019 that talks about Spitzer and all the discoveries that it's made. And um, as a last note, if you're a high school teacher, you should Google NITARP and then apply to come work with us and do real science with Spitzer data. So thanks very much for your attention. I'll take any other questions that you have. Got a question. These are people. Thank you very much. Um, do you have questions? Yes, I have a question. Yes. Uh, about Spitzer, uh, it's in orbit around the sun, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. And it's traveling faster than the Earth or in its orbit. No, it's trailing behind. So okay. it's going a little bit slower than the Earth. Oh, okay. Even so, uh, it would seem that eventually Spitzer will come uh, around, uh, mm -hmm. will be visible to the Earth again at some point in time. Yes, it will. Is there an estimate? Um, I don't remember off the top of my head, um, but here's something for scale. So a couple of years ago, maybe five years ago, um, there was uh, an announcement of, hey, we found this potentially hazardous asteroid that we didn't know about before. And wow, it could come really close to the earth. And there was a lot of hullabaloo and a lot of astronomers uh, took images of it and collected data. And boy, that's a weird ass asteroid. That's because it's a leftover Apollo second stage rocket. So 
on that time scale. So we're talking between the 1960s and the 20 teens. It was about that time scale for the, the bit of rocket to come back around. So it's going to take, I think, quite a while before Spitzer comes back around, but it will eventually. But the, the idea would be that since there are no moving parts in Spitzer, that it might be operational when it comes around again. Yes, and occasionally you get spacecraft that do that, which is all really good reasons to continue to hire engineers that still speak Fortran. Not too long ago, there was one of these spacecraft that had been thought to have been dead for a very long time, but it too finally came back around and they managed to talk to it, but they needed to find engineers who could still speak the same language that the spacecraft was programmed in. <laughs> So they had to find someone who spoke COBOL in order to talk to it, which they did. And they were able to at least get a signal back from it. Yeah, because that's those were the thoughts in my mind was, hey, it's coming. It's going to come around. You might see it again. Yep. Could, could it be used again? You know, for that I don't know. I mean, presumably by then our technology will have improved tremendously because even just over Spitzer's development cycle, the tech detector technology advanced quite a bit. So presumably by the time it comes back around, we will have better technology and we'll have at that point already launched more capable infrared missions. But yes, eventually it will come back around. Still somebody may at some point remember that and maybe give it a try and who knows yep. what we find. Absolutely. Okay, thank uh, you. It, it, may, uh, it may not be uh, able to control the attitude of the spacecraft after the, all that time. Right. Well, it does, it has some, uh, what we were using in order to control it is nitrogen thrusters. So it has some nitrogen left in the tank. Um, so, but you're right at this point, it's just spinning, it's just out there. So you're right that by the time it comes back around, I don't know, I don't know how much, I don't remember offhand how much is left in the tank, but there's not very much nitrogen left in the tank. Okay. Well, if I could follow up on that, um, <clears throat> whether Spitzer comes back around again or not. Um, Dr. Rebo, what would, what would you imagine, suppose there were no, um, no budget constraints or any, anything of that sort, what could you imagine, what would you want as a six, possible successor to Spitzer? Uh. So yeah, so um, the, the next big telescope that NASA is launching is called James Webb. And the Hubble people like to refer to it as the successor to Hubble, but it also it observes in the infrared. So it's kind of, but only the near infrared. So it's kind of like a weird Hubble Spitzer love child, right? Because it's kind of in that wavelength region yeah. between what Spitzer can do and what Hubble could do. Um, but so that's the next big one that's coming. But that is a really big telescope, and um, it it's it's got to work. I mean, it's the very definition of too big to fail. It's got to work. Um, but that's the next big one in terms of next uh, long infrared wavelength. Uh, I don't know of any in the you know, there's there's various the uh, telescopes in various design stages, including ones that are in the infrared. Um, but, you know, yes, it would be lovely to have no budget constraints. <laughs> it would be lovely to launch a big diameter telescope with all sorts of long wavelength capability from, you know, from the mid infrared to the far infrared to better understand how stars form. That's what I would use it for. But other people would use it for exoplanets. Other people would use it to study old galaxies, um, star formation in other galaxies, all sorts of things. There's so much stuff that you could do. Thank you. Other questions? I have a question. Yes. Yo, so can we go to the slide where you have shown different images in different wavelengths? Is, um... the, the first one, the one that was of the little yeah, galaxy? Uh, this one. Uh, yes. Um, I see in UV, you see young stars, and on, in uh, IR, you see very uh, unusually or, or old stars. It, they look pretty much coincide together. So is that, am, am I seeing it right? So the young stars are the same place as the old stars? 
So or, if you if you look in the visible, you can see that I mean this this galaxy is I think called a tadpole galaxy for obvious reasons, right? So you can see that there's texture in the galaxy here, right? And so it's not a very organized grand design spiral. It doesn't have beautiful spiral arms. It sort of has this hook, this comma shaped thing, right? And so that comma shaped thing you can see in all of these images in part because that's where the galaxy is, right? But you can see like here, there are little pockets of bright stuff. And those roughly correspond to those pockets of bright stuff because that's where the stars are forming. And you can also see them bright in the infrared because that's where the baby stars are. That's where the dust is that's being heated up by the hot stars. So here you can see that there are you know, discrete bubbles that are the discrete sources, which are the, the big star formation complexes. And here you don't really see them as points anymore. You just see the dust that's being heated by those star forming regions. And then here you've got some dust that's um, blocking the visible light, making it hard to see, but the infrared can more easily see through it. And you can see some of it, um, some of that fluff here, you can see some of that fluff in the ultraviolet as well. So you're seeing some things that are the same and some things that are different across all of these different wavelengths. Did that answer your question or did I wander too far off from what your question was? Uh, no, I think to some extent it did. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? We did have, we did have one more on the, on the chat line. Um, oh, the aperture, 85 centimeters. So not very big at all. 85 centimeters. Yeah. So really not very big. The Her the Herschel, that's five meters, I think, if I remember correctly. Um, yeah, so Herschel is much bigger. Spitzer is only 85 centimeters. So not too big at all. OK. OK. Other questions? Well, with that, Dr. Louisa Grable, thank you. For very that was a wonderful presentation. Thank you very much. Thank yeah. you. Thanks for letting yeah. me distract you. Everybody for a while. <laughs> um, and with that, let me let me call attention to two weeks from now, our next our next presentation on November twenty first. Uh, Dr. Linda Linda Schweitzer will be here for a book discussion. Her book is being published. Oh, uh, is oh, cosmic odyssey. How intrepid astronomers at Palomar Observatory changed our view <clears throat> of the universe. And she will be she will be discussing the book and uh, chance to ask questions. I've I've seen a pre -pub publication copy, and um, it's really quite an impressive impressive piece of uh, piece of uh, research. I always wondered what happened to her book. It's coming out because she was here. Uh, uh, I, I, she was here back back in the uh, Scott Cardell era, and I always wondered what happened to that. Yeah, she's uh, she's been working on it for a while. She had a grant from the Huntington uh, Museum to work on it, and uh, it's it's going to get published. I she she's here. As, as part of this discussion on November 21st. And I believe the book is being published um, on the 23rd or 24th. And we'll carry it in, uh, in the gift shop. What's the name of it? Cosmic Odyssey. Cosmic Odyssey. And the full title is How Intrepid Astronomers at Palomar Observatory changed our view of the universe. Mm -hmm. And a, yeah. Steve, I have a question for the speaker that I forgot. Sure. Uh, Dr. Dr. Rebel, you've been with Spitzer for a long time. Mm -hmm. Are you gonna professionally, are you gonna continue to resolve this data and work on some of the, some of the discoveries? Or are you yeah. gonna go on to newer and greater things? So it turns out that all of NASA's observatories, because they're paid for by your tax money, you own that data just like everybody else does. And so one of the really important things that all of these space-based observatories have is archives. 
So I actually now work for something called URSA, the Infrared Science Archive, and that's the final repository for all sorts of infrared data, including Spitzer and TUMAS and some Herschel data and other satellite infrared data. So I actually work to help design the archive and make it easy to use. And since that archive has to serve professional astronomers at all levels, from the emeritus professor who can barely read his email to the summer student starting on her very first research research project ever, that those archives have to serve all those people. So they serve you too, as long as you, because you guys know the basics of the astronomy, you can figure out how to get into it. But that's a whole separate talk that I can give if you'd like on some other time about how to access the wealth of data that we have at URSA and how to start playing with it. Because you know, if you've got a, a windy or a cloudy or a too humid night to use your own telescope, you can actually get into the archives and use some Spitzer data to combine with your own data and see if you can make some really pretty pictures. And now that would be intriguing, just so long as I don't have to go back and remember my Fortran. No, 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 no. It's all, all web browser based. You can play with it just in the web browser. Is there some difference in the excitement level of looking at real data as it's coming in uh, versus doing things from an archive? It seems kind of dry to me in a way. I mean, I'm not saying that important discoveries don't come out of archives. I know they do but it seems to me it wouldn't be as exciting. Well, you have to remember that Spitzer in almost all of these uh, space-based observatories, it's not like someone sitting there um, with a joystick yeah, or just, I, you know, or metaphorical eyepiece, right? So it's a robot, right? So it's gonna, it, we give it a series of instructions that goes off and completes the series of instructions and then comes back and calls home. I don't mean it flies away. I mean, it turns back to try to talk to, talk to earth and send all that data back. So. There's not a lot of sitting and waiting for it to come in in real time. It comes back in a chunk, right? Every 12 to 24 hours, it would come back in a chunk of data and then would get processed through the pipelines. And so um, you know, you're using the archives to get the data, whether it's brand new or whether it's 16 years old. And there's still lots of interesting science that can be done with that, with that supposedly old data because there's science buried in it that, you know, that hasn't been done yet. So yeah, professional astronomers don't need to see it in real time. <laughs> They're happy with being able to pull it out of the archive. I guess there is an excitement when you do pull it out of. Yeah, absolutely. Out of there, and you're the one that knows it. Exactly. And else knows it yet. Exactly. Exactly. Although, like I say, it's, it often sounds more like, "Oh, that's weird," <laughs> rather than, "Wow, that's so cool." It's more like. Why does it look like that? Did I screw something up? Right. Let me try to make sure that I didn't screw something up before I get excited about what it says. <laughs> well, thanks for a terrific talk. You're very welcome. Yes, thank you very much. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Last call. Great as always. Last call mm -hmm. on questions. Thanks. That was a great talk. I just. <clears throat> Excuse me, I wanted to let everybody know that we are going to carry the book, like you mentioned, Steve, um, uh, Cosmic Odyssey in the gift shop. And we have more things in the heavens, the, the book that you mentioned. We have that in the gift shop already. Awesome. I didn't know we were carrying that one. Very good. Very good. Uh, excuse me, uh, Steve. Yes. I, thought, I thought the observatory grounds were closed to the public. How do we get to the gift shop? Uh, thank you for asking. <laughs> um, you can call me. I'm here all day. <laughs> yeah. At, at the moment, we're taking orders over the phone. Okay. But we are getting ready to implement a, what's the term, a full service online um, gift shop and bookstore. Uh, that's being put together and that will come, you know, doing credit cards and all that, that, that will be installed hopefully within the next, at least next couple of months, maybe. Um, but uh, that's something we're working on. Okay. Okay. Hey. Steve, thanks for organizing these talks. They're great. Thank you. Yeah, they're very useful and fun to watch, Steve. A lot of fun to do. And I, hey, thank you, everybody. Thank you for coming and supporting it. And, uh, you know, we'll, 
we'll keep this up. <laughs> Looks like indefinitely now. <laughs> Thank you very much for supporting all this. And with that, if there are no other questions, I'm going to close off yeah, the meeting nice. and say goodbye. Yeah. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Bye.